Now, when you stay here, and you continue to stay here and practice, then remember one thing. There's a lot that we have to do, and there's little we need to understand. And there's little we have to know. The less district distraction, the better. And that in, especially if you are into samadhi, if you are trying to develop the calmness of the mind, then it's the best thing not to talk, not to interact in talking. You might not realize it at this time, but once you talk, once you talk only for half an hour or for an hour, this will keep you off your meditation after you start your meditation for hours. It, it, the mind will, will be occupied with the topics of your talk and tries to, tries to give cle more clever answers than one has given. What's the use of it? The talk is over, so finish it. And the best is not to talk at all. If you really, if you really want to get into practice, if you really want to get into the state of samadhi, then interact as little as possible, talk as little as possible, have mindfulness as much as possible. Mindfulness of the Buddha or mindfulness of the breath. Whatever kind of activity you can do, this is the you still can repeat the word Buddha or you can still observe the breath coming in and coming out. So there is no need to switch the object. Once you decided to stay on object, then stay on this object. And whatever activities you have to do, there you, you always will use this object. We want to get into one-pointedness. Don't forget it. One-pointedness means one point and not a lot point. One-pointedness means just this one point. So if our mind during the day goes constantly out and tries to, to interrogate this object or that object or this feeling or that feeling, these are different points. So we will never get into one-pointedness. Only if we are able to chuck out everything that is coming in, in our mind or in coming in our heart, then we will be able one day, sooner or later. And the sooner, the less you have interaction with other objects. Or, as in, in, in Pali, they are called aramanas. Aramanas are normally objects or objects of emotion. So, if you, if you do not deal them, you just notice them coming up and then just leave them as they are. And you go back to your breath or you go back to the Buddha. That is for the moment, you know, that is for developing the mindfulness of the breath or the mindfulness of the mental repetition of the word Buddha. And the more you can stay with it, from the moment you open your eyes till the, till the time you close your eyes, the better or the faster will be the results. So, please do not forget it. And whatever comes up, let it come up and then just chuck it out. Or don't pay any interest. If it's stubborn, you know, then just leave it there at the side and just continue with your practice. For instance, if the Kilesas don't like to practice, then then just tell them, you know, okay, you don't like to practice, but I go ahead with my practice. You can do whatever you want, but I'm interested about my practice. So just leave them aside. And they have to go. If, if we are determined, you know, to just to go on with our practice, they will have to leave. They're only, they can only live. And please understand that. The Kilesas can only live if we give them interest, if we pay some interest to them. If we don't give them any energy of our mind, they have to die away. 
at least for the time being. Once our mindfulness slips, then they take, and they might take all the energy we have. And so then we have to, to, to make a struggle to get some of it back. So the lapses of mindfulness, one has to be careful. When, when one has pretty good concentration and the mindfulness lapse and hops onto one topic one is interested in, and might be all the energy one has built up in the last two or three hours might get lost. So we have, once we see, you know, we are interested in a topic. And you know, you notice that I use the word interest. Interest in that what is going on around us. Is that what keeps the kilesas alive? They don't like to, they don't like to observe the breath. Or they don't like to repeat the word Buddha. They want to play. They want to play with all these things around us. With this object coming in our sight, or that object coming in our sight, or this object coming in our mind, or this sound coming in our ears, or this feeling coming out of the body, that's what they want to play with. That's what they want, that's what they're interested in. But if we as a practitioners do not pay any interest to this thing, except for our mental repetition of the word Buddha, or the breath coming in and coming out, well, where's the energy going? They don't have any energy and they have to die away. And that what gives us peace and restfulness and, and happiness. They are constantly, you know, they are constantly taking our attention. Constantly. Like a little child hanging on the skirt of the mother. If, if you go, and when, when you go shopping you might see, it. you know, the little child, you know, wants, sees this and wants it, sees that and wants that, sees that and, and if the mother gives in, then it even wants more. If the mother doesn't give in, then it cries and cries and cries. Until the mother either gives in, or it stops crying because it knows the mother doesn't pay any attention to it. And so it's the same with our practice. We just don't pay any attention to this crying little naughty child that are called the Kilis. And if we don't pay any attention to it, they will stop bothering us. Because they know they can't fool with us. And that's fine. Or that leads to stillness of mind or still leads to peacefulness of mind. But they are more cleverer than a little child. They know us much better than we know ourselves. So they will come with this and they will come with that. They might come with, with, with anger or they might come with, with greed or they might want this or they don't like this or they want to come with fear. Fear of death, or fear of dying, or fear of the unknown, or whatever it is called. And then they call, catch us there. Or they come, most common for the Westerners, with doubt. This kind of practice is not worthwhile continuing. Another practice should be more, more worthwhile, or more, brings more results. And then after three days we start another practice, and then, then another practice, and then another practice. And then in the end, when we look back, we will see it's just the way of the Kilesa. They fooled us in doing this, and they fooled us in doing that. Like they fooled us our whole, whole life doing this or doing that. Looking after wanting this or wanting that. Or not wanting this or not wanting that. And if you look at your life, it's like this. You're going for this or you're going for that. You don't go for this and you don't go for that. They are the ones who make the decision of your life. And you just say, okay, okay, go ahead, and I pay the price. And now when we get mindful, we are going to start to see it. And that's where we come in and interfere. Interfere with this power, with this power of avicca that kept us in prison for such a long time. So, if we are not going against the wardens of the prison, if we do not take away their power in this prison, then we will stay in this prison forever. They don't let us go. They don't let us go without a fight. And we have to learn this fight. How to trick them. 
how to trick them and how to overcome them. Where was I? Hmm? Okay. Yes, once, once uh, I get out of the something, something uh, shrill noise, you know, gets me out of the concentration. I have to start over again. So, the kilesas are the ones who trick us. And if we don't, if we don't fool them, or if we don't trick them, and we can only trick them with determination and effort, just to stay at the same thing. That's the thing that the most loathe. They think it, it's much, it's the most boring thing to just to look at the breath. It's the most boring thing. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We look at the most boring thing and make it the most interesting thing so that all our energy, all our attention is on that point. <coughs> you understand? The interest is the most important. The interest is that that keeps us there. If the interest is going to diminish, then the Kilesas have the chance to take, take over the power. Because there are only two forces. Two forces on the throne. On the throne who reigns us. That is, the, that is the power of light. That means the power of Dhamma. Or it's the power of the darkness. That means the power of Avicca. Only one can tell us what to do. So if we give the, the Dhamma the chance, then it will do the practice. If our interest in the Dhamma diminishes because we think it's too boring or we, we just don't have any result, because we should have, after five minutes, we should have at least some results, or m maybe not after five minutes, at least after an hour, or maybe after ten days, or after three weeks, whatever, then we stop. Then the, then the Kilesas tell us, you know, oh, it's much nicer to go on, on the beach, you know, or to go shopping or do this and do that and have a lot of fun. If we do this, if we follow the persuasion, and they are most, the most persuasive persons in this world, we believe whatever they say. There are little birds, you know, behind our ears and they tell us, oh, this is nice and this would be nice or that would be nice. Oh, let's go doing this or let's go doing that. And they have such a sweet or honey voice, you know, and then it just goes in, just goes in and says, yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> and then off we go. If we have developed some mindfulness in our practice or with our practice, then if, if we are forced or if we cannot if we think we cannot make it and then we go out in the world, then at least let us check it out if what they promise us is true. If that what they promise us or if that what we are doing leads to wholesome results or not. And if we really check it out, we will see it will not lead to a wholesome result. It will just lead to a lot of agitation of the heart. A lot of restlessness in the heart. And the agitation can be either positive, we can, we can um, see it as positive or negative. Lust can be, we see as positive. But lust is also agitation. The lust for the senses is also agitation. When you listen to music, when you read a book, when you read a book or when you meet a person, you know, it's always agitating the heart. It's troubling the heart. It makes it either excited or angry. It never stays calm. So, we better check this out. So when we go back into the world, then we better check this out. If the promises of the Kilesas are really fulfilled, only this. It's not that we should not do this or we should not do that. As long as it's within the five precepts, it's okay. But still check this out. If you do something that is within the five precepts, and you do, then check it out the result. In the world we do it all the time, you know, when we buy something, you know, 
because we have to to give our money that we have that took us such a hard time, you know, to earn it. And if we don't get the results for our money, then we will not buy the product anymore. Or we'll, we'll try to give it back. So why don't you do it with the mind? It's the same thing. The Kilesas always tell us, if you do this or if you do that, you will be happy or you will be satisfied or this will be exciting or that or that or that. And then we go for it and never check it out. But when you go in a shop, you know, you check it out, you know, and if it doesn't satisfy your needs, you don't buy it again. Or you give it, if you can, you give it back. You want your money back. So, and we want our chitta back. We are all in trouble. Our heart is constantly agitated. Or it's hot as fire. And we don't see that we are the ones who are doing this fire. We are the ones who produce this fire. By thinking about this or by thinking about that, by wanting this or by not wanting that. That's how we produce the fire of greed, either greed that's wanting or hate that is not wanting or dislike. So we should, you know, at least you know, be honest with yourself. Now, honest with other people, it's difficult to be honest to other people. Just to tell them, it's difficult. But, most difficult is to be honest to oneself. So when you go, when you go and want to go in a movie, or when you want to go in a restaurant, then before you do that, ask yourself, how is the heart at the moment? And when you're truly investigating, you always see there's a displeasantness in the heart. Unpleasant feeling. And because we want to evade this unpleasant feeling, we think about an action that promises us happiness or satisfaction. Maybe satisfaction guaranteed, yes? <laughs> I would say, you know, it's much more like dissatisfaction is guaranteed. If the Kilesas are promising something to us, then Dissatisfaction is guaranteed. There is no satisfaction in what the Kilesas want. The satisfaction comes just from the pure heart. That, when the heart is still and not agitated anymore, that doesn't mean that we have to be vegetable. That vegetable can just lie on our ground. Once the heart doesn't get agitated, you know, it can go in the world, you know, and the world will be just the world. But the heart, you know, is not involved with the world anymore. But this is something that we have to learn. And this is something we have to learn through the, through the path of investigation. And what I just talked before, you know, is part of this investigation. First to check it out. You know, and if it doesn't produce this wholesome results or happy results or exciting results as we thought of, then we don't do it again. And then the next thing is, is to investigate why is it coming up. So there's some dissatisfaction. So let's, let's look. Oh, yes, I remember. Anicca. Whatever, whatever arises must cease. So then we stay with the unsatis unsatisfying Vedana or thought or, or whatever. Until it ceases away. Until it goes away. We just stay and observe the feeling that comes in the feeling how it comes. And when it goes, then it changes to another feeling. And then it changes to another feeling. And that is, it, that is the nature. It's the nature of our chitta. And our chitta that is defined. So it will, always, it will always produce something negative or positive. Most of the time it's more negative than positive. That's why we have so little sukha or that's why we have so little happiness and satisfaction in this world. And if you remember and if you look back or reflect back on your life, you might, you might notice that, uh, that maybe within a day you, you might have had five or ten minutes of happiness and the rest was hard work and agitation and troubles and worries and, and so on and so on. But we latch onto these five or ten minutes of happiness and then then we feel better. 
understand one thing. Whatever arises, arises just within our heart. That's where it arises. And that's where we observe it. The outside, the world outside, and the beings outside are just the triggers of things that come up within our own heart. If you love or if you love love uh, some sort, you know, ways or whatever it is, some sort of material object, and the love arises or a wish or want arises for this material object, you wouldn't say that this material object, you know, carries in the love itself. The love arises within the heart, but when it's a, another being then we think this person is the maker of our love. Or it's the maker of our, of our longing. It's just a trick. It just sets something free within our own heart. The love that we feel is the love within our own heart. It's not the love of the other person. Remember this. Whatever arises, arises just within our own heart. Nowhere else. The other person, you know, maybe, maybe the opposite sex, is just the trigger. It has nothing to do with us. It just triggers something. And when we see that it triggers something, then we are going to investigate what it triggers. It triggers a longing. Why does it trigger a longing? So we investigate. What do we want? What do we want from this object or what do we want from this person? What is this person promising us what, that we don't have? And that is the most ca in most cases true. The object or the person is promising, promising something that we do not have, at least not at the moment. But where do the things arise? Within our own heart. So if we, if we are looking then for the thing that it promises within our own heart, then we don't need this object. That's fantastic, isn't it? That makes us completely self-sufficient. And that is the only way, if we really understand this principle, that is the only way how we can get completely self-sufficient. Completely whole. Not lacking anything at all. Not worrying about anything at all. If you understand this little, little principle, that everything arises within our heart, and the things that are lacking, we can develop within our heart, or we can find within our heart. It's all there. It's all there. Whole. We have separated. We have separated ourselves from us. We have separated ourselves from our true nature. And that what is what is the feeling that is what what produces the feeling of loneliness within us. And because of the feeling of loneliness we do so many things. We cannot stay alone because we are afraid of loneliness. So we have to look for friends or we have to look for a partner or we have to look for a society or for a group that thinks like us. Because we cannot Stay alone. We cannot be alone. Even our thoughts be alone. We always have to look for people who think similar thoughts, who have or who have similar views and opinions about life. Then we feel comforted. Then we don't feel alone. Then we think, you know, what we think is not not really out of the question. But when we are alone with our thoughts and our opinions. And nobody in the whole world shares these opinions with us, then we are pretty much alone. Except, of course, for this, this fool that is called a Naran. Because he's completely <laughs> a fool. Yes, he's a fool. Why is he a fool? He's, he's in a, in a sense, he's crazy. But crazy because he sees the things from a different point of view. When you take the German word, that means crazy. 
And for it means just taking another point of view. Just stepping aside. Once we step aside, we have a different angle of view, how to see the thing. So in this sense, an arahant is completely crazy or foreign. In the other sense, in the sense of the world, of course, no. But for the, for the human beings or for the beings in this, in this world or in this cosmos, a person who is completely satisfied with himself or is completely whole and doesn't want anything at all, for, these pe- for, for this world, you know, he's crazy. Because we want so much from this world. We want to change the world, to be a good world. But what is a good world? A good is only a, our views and our opinions what is good. It doesn't necessarily mean that what we think is good, another person is thinking the same way. That's why we look for the same kinds of people who think this is good, you know, and and then we feel safe. We will we we will feel safe with our views and opinions, and that's why we don't have to change them. But if you live alone, you have to get rid of them, because there is nobody sharing your opinion, and you will see that they are just a damn nuisance. Just get rid of all your opinions and you will see the truth. So attached. And so that's why Buddhists run to Buddhists and Christians run to Christians and peacemakers are running to peacemakers and Greenpeace is running to Greenpeace and the Greens are running to the Greens and the Blacks are running to the Blacks or Conservatives because they have to share the same views and opinions about life. Human beings are like a, you know, like, like a cow herd. They need a, they need a leader and then they follow. Because we cannot stay alone. And even if the herd is very little, it's very few animals. Then we still feel safe. But alone we don't feel safe. And that, that is the reason why the Lord Buddha teaches us, or teaches the practitioners of his Dhamma, to go out alone in the forest, or in the, in the caves, or on the hills, or, or in the open, where there is nobody, to see, to see what is, you know, what it boils down to. And the teacher, in this place, is, will be the forest, or will be the wind, or will be the heat, or will be the rain. It will be the nature. And because we love to, to be in the forest, that's why it's called the Forest University. The forest is teaching us the truth. Being always in the forest, just being alone, you know, just a, when you are alone, you cannot, you cannot find fault with anybody else. Because there's only you, the only person you can find fault with is yourself. And that actually helps. Because then you have to realize, okay, it's within me, you know. The leaf or the tree doesn't have any fault. It has been grown there for for a time. Even if if I run again, then this is the lack of my mindfulness. But it's not the fault of the tree, and we can see that clearly. When we when we tread on a snake, you know, then it was our fault because our mindfulness wasn't there. We were thinking about this or thinking about that and didn't see the snake. So, when it bites us, it's our fault because we weren't mindful enough. We cannot blame anybody else. We just can blame ourselves. And that's why the Lord Buddha calls it, these are the most, most, uh, what do you say? Auspicious places for practice. But as long as we don't have the, a firm basis, it's not yet time to go out. We need to have a pretty stable mind to be able to deal with all the difficulties. And don't think the difficulties are little. The difficulties come. Maybe for a week you feel happy. But if you stay there for months and months and months, you know, you, it will be very dreaded.
And because this, this simple, the simplicity of the nature can teach us the truth, that's why we should be there. I remember, and I like to remember, there was one story in the, in the Zen tradition of China, where one of the, where one of the abbot kicked out a monk who was trying to be cleverer than the abbot himself. So he kicked him out and said, you know, there is a cave, and what is your job? Your job is to, to um, sweep the, in front of the cave or sweep the cave. And when you're finished with this work, you can come back. So he stayed there for a year, for five years, for ten years, every day from the morning till the evening he was sweeping the cave. Only after twenty years sweeping the cave, he realized the truth of sweeping. It doesn't matter if it's the truth of sweeping or if it's the truth of walking or if it's the truth of sitting or if it's the truth of looking at the cave, or looking at the forest, or whatever. So he found the truth. And once he found the truth, then there was not, no need anymore to go back to the monastery. He has finished his work. Finished the work of getting rid of the kilesas that make this, the sweeping, 20 years of sweeping, the front of the cave, you know, the most dreadful task ever. So, and then after, after he realized the truth, the abbot came and see him. So he went to see him and asked, you know, so, you finished with sweeping, so why didn't you come back? And he answered, you know, there wasn't any need anymore to come back. He was whole in himself. He has realized the truth and he was happy with himself. So what is the use of going back? Wherever he is, you know, he is. So in the simplicity, you know, I just read, I just take this, 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 these little examples or these little similes or this, these stories, you know, to, to show you the simplicity of life will teach us the lesson. It's not this complex world of, of, of airplanes, of trains, of, of buses and, and shops and, and, you know, eating places and beaches and so on or mathematics, or physics, or whatever. Economics that teaches us the truth. No, it's the simplicity of walking up and down, or sitting in samadhi, or sweeping, you know, sweeping in front of the cave. This simplicity, if it's done correctly, will teach us the truth about everything. Just remember this. The more complicated the life is, we think it's more, more enticing. It's more exciting. And we try to figure out, the more complex a thing is, the more interesting it is. That's why we can't stay with the simplicity of life. This, the life itself is so simple. And if you look at the, the, the path of the Lord Buddha, who teaches us to investigate the five khandas, the five groups our personality is made up. If you understand the working of this clock, how the five khandas work together to produce what we see and what we now see as world and as I, then it's most amazing. It's so simple. It's just like a clockwork, clockwork turning around, turning around. Once we take off the pointers, and once we take off the numbers, then there is no meaning. It just turns and turns and turns and turns. It just doesn't tell us the time. If you take off the pointers and if you take off the numbers, it just doesn't tell us anything. But it still turns around and turns around. And once we have understood that it just turns around and there is no meaning to it at all, then we will find freedom. The freedom of the mind. The clock still turns around until the body is dead. And, that's it. and then it's finished. There will be no more body, there will be no more clock. Because the maker of this clock has been disguised. So. Now for the time being, you know, remember this. Always try to remember this. It's the simplicity of things. 
that make us understand. It's the simplicity of touching the fire to know that it's hot. But we can discuss it forever, if it's hot, warm or cold, because we see the interaction of the fire with the other elements. But if we touch the fire, we will know for ourselves, and we don't have to ask another question. And no matter whatever anybody else will say, we know for ourselves. So touch the fire of truth and you will be relieved. <clears throat> you will understand and you, you, you don't need any diploma for that. You just know it yourself. That is the truth. You don't have to go and ask another teacher you know, to confirm the truth. Even if the Lord Buddha sits in front of you, you don't have any more questions. Because the Dharma and the Lord Buddha is one and the same. And because you are the Dharma, the moment you are relieved of Avicca, you are the Dharma. So the Dharma is you and you are the Buddha. So it's all one and the same thing. So where are the questions? There are more, no more questions. So I want you to go into this direction. I want you to see the truth. And remember that the things are simple. So if we distract ourselves with complicated talks or with complicated thoughts, thinking about the future of human life, for instance, we never can solve. Or trying to change our past, it's futile. Change the present. Look at the present. And it's all completely there. Everything, everything in itself, in the whole cosmos, makes sense. There is nothing that we need to change. The only thing we need is to comply with this truth. Not to go against it. And that is our, that is our keeping up these five kandas. To go against the truth. Once we realize this truth is as it is and there is no way to change it, then we comply with it and we are relieved. And that is the end of the matter. And that is the end of all our troubles and all our worries and all our fears. And all what remains is Paramang Sukha. The, the overworldly happiness. And even if the body still exists, you know, the body and the, and the five kandas still give us some troubles because they still work as the clockwork works. So they will give us, you know, the, the wheels will grind uh, against each other and that will make some unpleasant feelings. So. But once the, clock, once the clockwork finishes, once we die, you know, that's the end. So, put some effort in it. You know how to go, go along the path? And the first thing is that you have to find this inner stillness. And that's where you have to put all your effort. If you really want to find it, you can do it. That's not the question. You really can do it. It just depends on your mindfulness, determination and effort not to let go of your object. That's all what it needs. Nothing else. Not to let go. Think about, think of it as being, you know, drifting in the high seas, you know, and just having a plank of wood. I don't think you would let go of this plank. So, the Buddha or the breath is your plank that keeps you alive. So don't let go of it. And that, you know, brings you very far into the deep state of Samadhi. Or at least in the Upachara. And then go on. Go down. Go down and find a preview of the Nibbana. You really will like it. There's no doubt. I've never seen anybody who doesn't like it. But there are only a few people who, who really put their effort in it. 
Because the world, you know, these little birds that are behind our ears, or the earworms, you know, how you, however you call it, you know, they crawl in, you know, and come down with a lot of honey and, and sugar and, and it feels so nice and so. That's why the kilesas are also called sugar-coated poison. The outside is sweet and the inside is poison. And now think, now think about it how, for long, how, for how long you have taken the sugar-coated poison. How much poison is there in this body? We have died so many times because of this poison. But we have been reborn and we put even more poison in it and more poison. When are you going to stop to put the poison in your body? We from the West are so concerned about having poisonous food but never concerned about having a poisonous chitta. Why? We take everything, you know, we, 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 make, we make our life so hard or make a hardship out of it, not to, you know, to, to get proper food. Proper food for a body that has to die away. But we never give it a proper food for the mind. Never. We take anything in that is poison. And of course, a poison has a sort of exciting feature. It excites, you know, excites the nerves and excites the way. And that's what we are only looking after. The after effect that the poison has, you know, it blames us and it makes us feel like prisoners we never look at. So take a good look. And especially if you are out in the world, take a good look at the sugar-coated poison that you always take in. And when you think about your food and concerned about your food, that you take some poison with it, because some of the farmers have sprayed it with some chemical. That's about the mind that is sprayed with the chemicals or with the poison of the kilesa that you eat up and love to eat up and love to follow and love to swallow. And with this I end the